this kind of takes us to one of the key things you say at the end of the book, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you, you talk uh, about the case for, uh, we say class first uh, politics, which is funny actually, because this, this is terminology I'm not used to seeing usually uh, exactly. Although I remember in uh, a few years ago, Noah Berlatsky wrote an article about me about the, where he, he, he said I was a class first leftist at the time. I was like, I, I don't know what that means really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and he seemed to, what he seemed to mean by that is that I didn't care about like you know, racism and sexism and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But um, nobody cares about racism or sexism as much as Noah Berlatsky. I can promise you that. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm, I'm not even going to try. Uh, but um, but you make these um, you make these distinctions between um, you know like genuine class reductionism, which you say you know you're not going to say it absolutely doesn't exist, but you know it's it's uh, you know if you know if it does, it's vanishingly rare mm -hmm. uh, and a sort of strategic uh, class first approach, which I, which I see that you're also uh, wrote about for your, your sub stack uh, just, just now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean, you want to just kind of get into a little bit what that sort of strategic argument is for, for an emphasis on class. Yeah, sure. So um, the problem with identity politics, um, which, you know, I'd like to think that I'm, uh, well, I'm not obviously not claiming to be at that level, but I'd like to think that I'm sort of coming at this in the tradition of somebody like Eric Hobsbawm, right? So, um, uh. Uh, uh, who wrote a really uh, excellent critique of identity politics that I encourage everybody to, to read. Um, <clears throat> the problem with identity politics is that identities, the way that they are defined today, are small, right? Um, they are smaller than uh, what you need to uh, create a political majority anywhere, right? Uh, now, the caveat to that is that people have long said, well, woman is a identity and that's half the population. But unfortunately, in 2016, 40% of, or 44% of women voters, white women voters, uh, voted for Donald Trump. So it's, right. it's not really a reliable uh, voting bloc. Um, and it's not just that like identities are small, right? Where, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say you are someone who really is invested in your Asian identity. That's great. You have politics that are informed by your Asian identity. That's great. You have special attention that you pay, pay, uh, pay to any sort of issues that you think are relevant to Asian people. That's all great. It remains the case that Asian people are something like 6% of the population in this country, right? And so you cannot possibly mount a meaningful electoral victory, a meaningful electoral charge, um, just with your identity group. And what I find particularly bizarre about um, <clears throat> uh, the sort of contemporary identity politics is that they keep slicing the onion thinner and thinner, mm -hmm. right? So it's, if you look at, for example, at the concept of BIPOC, um, you see different definitions of this uh, online, um, but the way that I learned about it when I was in grad school is that BIPOC means black and indigenous people of color, which is meant to specifically separate those people of color, uh, you know, black people, indigenous people from Hispanic and uh, Asian uh, people who are sometimes referred to as white adjacent, right? So it's like, okay, well, now you've just taken, okay, let's say we had the, the coalition of people of color. Now you've defined an even smaller subset. And then you sort of get into these cross-sectional things, right? Where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, uh, okay, well, uh, our movement is for uh, uh, women, you know, queer BIPOC uh, women, for example, yeah. et cetera, cisgender women or whatever you want to say. Um, that just can't work. The math just doesn't work, right? Like just the, the, the math of identity politics is pretty broken. Um, and so uh, the, the benefit of a class first approach is, um, Something like 80% of this country, and uh, sort of just defined loosely, something like 80% of this country uh, is regularly in uh, ex experiencing um, sort of patches of material insecurity, right? So uh, I've been saying since my first book that um, I think 
I understand why the we are the 99% is useful framing and the 1% is useful framing. But I think that in a very deep sense, the separation is between the, the top 20% and the bottom 80% mm -hmm. uh, of income uh, of, of earners. And I will, I will uh, say up front, I am, I am part of the top 20%, by the way. So just throwing that out there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, something like 80% of Americans regularly encounter some sort of, uh, financial hardship, material hardship that scares them, that makes them feel insecure, that uh, leaves them without uh, an immediate recourse. Uh, and that, and, and yes, like someone at the 75th percentile, right? Uh, 75th percentile of earners is someone who can still have a sudden shock, financial shock, that leaves them wondering what they're going to do next. Um, class focused politics work for a variety of reasons, but the most important is that. Um, the coalition of people who uh, find themselves facing material insecurity and who need help navigating the, the 21st century economy, which is an economy based on uh, creating a tiny class of winners and a big class of losers. Uh, it's an economy based on uh, the destruction of labor security, not just in terms of unions and labor, the labor movement, but the casualization of labor, forcing people from salaried positions where they have benefits to being gig workers, for example. That, that, that the potential coalition of people who face those uh, things is just bigger than anything else you can imagine. And so uh, you have to, we have to really reemphasize the sense that coalitions and solidarity are not about liking each other, right? Mm -hmm. On an interpersonal level. So to give you an example, um, <clears throat> the American labor movement and in, in auto unions, for example, the UAW, if you read some of the history of the UAW, there was certainly some <clears throat> uh, scenes of uh, black and white uh, camaraderie underneath the umbrella of the union. But there was also uh, a long history of racial antagonism within uh, the UAW, of uh, <clears throat> sort of the of different races sort of becoming blocks that uh, were sometimes uh, <clears throat> in a great deal of tension with each other, but when it came time to secure the next big contract, right? Uh. They recognized their mutual shared interest. And so they worked together. And I think one of the unfortunate things about the way that the personal is political, that idea, which for the record, I think is the worst thing that ever happened to the left. One of the ways that the, that the notion that the personal is, the, is political has damaged the left is that it's made people uh, unwilling to countenance the idea of being in coalition with and being in solidarity with someone you just don't like, right? Someone you would never hang out with, someone you don't want to come visit your home, but someone who you can use their vote, you can mm -hmm. use their ability to strike, you can use their ability to fundraise, and the two of you can find mutual uh, <clears throat> power uh, according to your shared best interests. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>